Good morning. I hereby call to order this ninth meeting of the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission for the year 2024. We welcome everyone joining us here in the room today and those watching on the live stream. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. At today's meeting, which is open to the public, the Commission will act on various matters. There is no opportunity for the public to address the Commission at this public meeting. The public meeting motions, statements, and video will be available on the Commission's website later today. The first matter on this morning's agenda is the approval of the minutes of the meeting of May 9th, 2024. I would like to recognize Commissioner Zerfus as the editor of the minutes. Commissioner Zerfus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, re I have reviewed the minutes of the May 9th, 2024 public meeting and moved that they be approved as submitted. You've heard the motion by Commissioner Zerfus. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Vice Chair Barrow. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The minutes are approved by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary, we're ready for your presentation. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, Commissioners. Your various bureaus and offices have prepared the following agenda items for your consideration. Therefore, let us begin on page one with the recommendation of Director Monahan and the Bureau of Audits that the Commission release the Gas Cost Rate Audit Report of Siegel Gas LLC to the public. Is there a motion to consider the staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Motion made by Commissioner Coleman, seconded by Commissioner Yonora. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Turning to page two, it is recommended by Director Moore and the Bureau of Consumer Services that the Commission adopt the proposed order and the Universal Service Working Group to maximize participation in the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. Is there a motion to consider the staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion made by Vice Chair Barrow, seconded by Commissioner Zerfus. Any discussion? Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Zerfus. Mr. Chairman, I would like to uh, offer a joint statement on behalf of the two of us, and I'd like to add it to the record, please, um, as if I read it in its entirety. But on behalf of Chairman DeFrank and myself, um, today the Commission issues an order that in part affirms its support of the intention of the Department of Human Services, DHS, to begin sharing income and household information for the low income home energy assistance program, we all know that as LIHEAP, with electric and natural gas utilities if the household consents. This data sharing would begin with the 2024-2025 LIHEAP season. While participation in the DHS data sharing is optional, the commission encourages all eligible utility, energy utilities to participate. This order addressing DHS's data sharing is the first step resulting from the Commission's formation of the Universal Service Working Group in September of 2023. LIHEAP data sharing promotes program efficiencies and eliminates paperwork redundancies by allowing customers who are eligible for LIHEAP to enroll or recertify in Energy Utilities Universal Service programs without submitting new applications. This includes enrollment or recertification in an energy utilities customer assistance program, low income usage reduction program, and hardship fund program without the household being required to submit separate applications and duplicative forms of documentation for each program. These improvements will result in cost savings and reduce red tape bureaucracy to the benefit of customers and energy utilities alike. In addition to discussing DHS's data sharing, the work working group productively collaborated on other topics which address ways to increase coordination of low-income customer assistance programs amongst utilities, streamline the eligibility and enrollment process, and reduce the number of eligible customers from losing benefits. The effort of this working group will help the Commission achieve its statutory obligations to continue the protections, policies, and services that assist customers' ability to afford electric and natural gas service. So thank you to Commission staff, to DHS, the utilities, the advocates, and other stakeholders who have worked diligently to help us get to this point. We look forward to more good things coming out of the Universal Service Working Group. 
So again, in, close, in closing, we encourage all energy utilities to participate in DHS's data sharing and take the necessary steps outlined in our actions today. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Zerfus. Any further comments? Uh, I would like to also add, this comes from our joint motion uh, with Commissioner, myself and Commissioner Zerfus when we first started, about a year and a half ago now. Um, a work group was formed, and this is the first step as a result of that work group. This is the type of stuff that I think is common sense approach to making sure dollars go to the individuals who need them most. Um, so I also want to thank you know, DHS, utilities, stakeholders, advocates, uh, the staff at BCS, the staff at Law Bureau, staff at comms, uh, from my office, uh, Joel Cheskis worked on this. I want to thank all the staff there for bringing this uh, forward and to bring us to the point we are today. Any further comments? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Turning to page three and matters presented by Director Hafner and the Office of Special Assistance, it should be noted that the first item, the formal complaint of Noreen McCarthy versus the Metropolitan Edison Company, has been postponed until the public meeting of July 11th, 2024. Continuing at the bottom of page three, it is recommended that the Commission adopt the proposed opinion and order in the formal complaint of Waterco Springs LLC versus PPL Electric Utilities. Is there a motion to consider the staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion made by Commissioner Unor, seconded by Commissioner Zerfus. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero, Madam Secretary. Turning to page four. It is recommended that the Commission adopt the proposed opinion and order regarding the letter of notification for construction of a transmission line filed by PPL Electric Utilities. Is there a motion to consider the staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion made by Commissioner Zerfus, seconded by Commissioner Coleman. Any discussion? Chairman, I have a statement. Vice Chair Barrow. Please enter uh, this joint statement by Chairman DeFrank and myself into the record as though read in its entirety. Before the commission is um, what I call a unique letter of notification because it was fully litigated. Um, by the OCA and PPL. While the record does favor PPL's application as submitted, we appreciate the engagement of the Office of Consumer Advocate for um, in this technical proceeding, which is too often overlooked. Local transmission build-out will continue to be a, of significant importance over the next decade and willingness to consider alternative approaches and encourage utilities to get the most out of their systems and the most out of ratepayer money is a worthwhile endeavor. While we believe that the record evidence as submitted supports PPL's letter of notification, we also believe that grid-enhancing grid technologies such as dynamic line ratings, advanced conductors, advanced power flow controls, present an opportunity not just to minimize needed infrastructure, but also to expand the benefits of an infrastructure project for the long term at a low marginal cost impact. We encourage PPL to incorporate grid enhancing technologies into local projects if it determines that adding them would reduce congestion increase market efficiency, and ultimately provide the benefit cost ratio um, needed. Additionally, this is the seventh such application involving the core 10 pack rust issue, which also affects much of the rest of PPL's 230 kV system. Just as adding grid enhancing technologies may maximize the benefit cost ratio, PPL might also consider holistic planning for the same purpose. Because the pack rust issue <clears throat> is widespread, PPL should consider whether rebuilding the existing network is the most cost-effective way in which to serve the long-run needs of the system, especially in the presence of expected load growth for the first time in decades. This holistic reevaluation is especially important 
because the PAC rest evaluations that PPL performed and the solutions proposed to address that need largely predated the forecast of significant load growth in the system. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Barrow. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Continuing at the bottom of page four, it is recommended that the commission adopt the opinion and order in the formal complaint of Marcus Culver versus the Philadelphia Gas Works. Is there a motion to consider the staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion made by Vice Chair Barrow, seconded by Commissioner Yonora. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Turning to page five. Consistent with 4 PA Code Section 1.43C, the notational vote regarding the Keystone Appalachian Transmission Company's letter of notification be recorded and entered in the minutes of this public meeting. Is there a motion to consider the staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion made by Vice Chair Barrow, seconded by Commissioner Zerfus. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Continuing on page five, it is recommended that the commission adopt in an omnibus motion, beginning with the application filed by his loving hand home care LLC and continuing the omnibus to adopt both items on page six, ending the omnibus with the application filed by AAME Transportation LLC. Is there a motion to consider the staff recommendations? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion made by Commissioner Coleman, seconded by Commissioner Yonora. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Turning to page seven, in matters presented by Director Diskin and the Bureau of Technical Utility Services, it is recommended that the Commission adopt in an omnibus motion both items on page seven, beginning with the application of Cincinnati Bell Extended Territories, LLC, doing business as Alta Filter Connected Services, and continuing the omnibus to include both items on page eight, both items on page nine, <clears throat> both items on page 10, both items on page 11, all three items on page 12, all three items on page 13, all three items on page 14, and including both items on page 15. Ending the omnibus with the security certificate filed by the Pike County Light and Power Company. Is there a motion to consider the staff recommendations? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion made by Vice Chair Barrow, seconded by Commissioner Zerfus. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. <clears throat> the ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Turning to page 16 and matters presented by Chief Administrative Law Judge Rainey and the Office of Administrative Law Judge, it is recommended that the Commission adopt the initial decision of ALJ Ashton in the formal complaint of Zamora's One Stop Beauty Bar versus the Pico Energy Company. Is there a motion to consider the staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Motion made by Commissioner Zerfus, seconded by Commissioner Coleman. Any discussion? Chairman, I have a statement. Vice Chair Barrow. Thank you. Please enter the statement in the record as though read in its entirety. This is a formal complaint filed by Zamora's One Stop Beauty Bar, a uh, hair salon, and the um, filed against Pico, alleging incorrect charges and an inability to pay, noting that the uh, beauty salon was going through hardship. Um, Multiple pre-hearing notices advise the beauty bar of the requirement that a commercial customer needed to be represented by counsel. The owner, Ms. Thomas, ultimately did not attend the telephonic hearing as scheduled and an attorney did not enter their appearance on her behalf. The initial decision dismissed the formal complaint with prejudice. While I agree with the dismissal of the formal complaint, I do not agree that it should be dismissed with prejudice. 
And I want to take the opportunity to highlight the Commission's Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, mm -hmm. which sought comments on um, sections, revisions to sections 1.21 and 1.22 of our regulations relating to appearance of appearance by an attorney or a certified legal intern. Consistent with my motion there, I believe that a permissive approach to representation for small businesses, some of them would, are, are the smallest of the small, they're mom and pop, there's like one person involved in the business, um, would better facilitate the ability of, of those businesses to conduct um, their, their business in Pennsylvania and also allow them to seek redress here at the commission um, for utility issues. In this case, Ms. Thomas was unable to participate in the adjudication of her claim against PICO. And I do note that this is um, the second complaint that she has had where she was notified that she needed an, an attorney. Um, it seems counterproductive to me to require a small business that is struggling to pay their utility bill to be able to afford an attorney who is skilled in this very niche um, work that we do. The commission should be promoting and encouraging small business owners to seek assistance or bring their utility claims to the commission, not discouraging them um, by Im imposing additional monetary burdens. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Barrow. Any further discussion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Zerfus. Mr. Chairman, I would like to associate myself with the comments of Vice Chair Barrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Continuing on page 16, it is recommended that the Commission adopt the recommended decision of ALJ Collins in the 1307F purchased gas cost filing by the National Fuel Gas Distribution Corporation. Is there a motion to consider the staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Motion made by Commissioner Coleman, seconded by Commissioner Yonora. Any discussion? Mr. Chairman, I have a statement. Mr. Zerfus. Mr. Chairman, Madam Secretary, please add this statement to the record as if I read it in its entirety, but I'll try to summarize it. But before the Commission is the joint petition for settlement of the rate investigation for National Fuel Gas Distribution Corporation, NFG. It involves the annual reconciliation of the company's purchase gas cost rates. This matter is litigated with full participation of the statutory advocates and resulted in a settlement of all the issues. In her recommended decision, ALJ Sharice Collins recommends approval of the settlement without modification, and I agree and will be voting yes to approve the settlement as proposed. I commend the company for proposing and the statutory advocates for vetting the unique proposal involving the Certified Natural Gas CNG pilot program. CNG is natural gas that has been evaluated and verified by an independent third party to have been produced with reduced greenhouse gas and environmental impacts beyond current regulations. It involves low carbon gas produced from certified wells, which can, be, which can reduce methane emissions up to 80% from traditional wells. The company is proposing to implement a three-year pilot designed to purchase CNG. The settlement <coughs> affirms that NFG will pursue the least cost CNG and will undertake commercially responsible efforts to minimize the cost impact to its PGC customers. The company has affirmed additional safeguards for ensuring that it will only pursue certifications with well-known and established certification entities in the market with proven records of working with some of the largest natural gas producers in the country and around the world to track and reduce emissions. Credibility of the certification process is key, and I believe that the settlement takes important steps in that direction. I believe the settlement is in the public interest, and as correctly noted by the Office of Consumer Advocate, the damage caused by global warming, largely caused by greenhouse gas emissions, is a significant worldwide concern. And as co-vice chair of the NARUC U.S. Department of Energy Task Force on Evolving Gas Infrastructure Planning, I'm helping to review the best practices of similar programs occurring throughout the country. 
I believe the CNG pilot program before us will provide the company and other Pennsylvania NGDCs with the experience and knowledge to minimize the costs associated with implementing greenhouse gas reduction strategies. This in turn could provide a positive example and a practical solution for addressing emission reductions nationwide. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Zerfus. Any further comments? Chairman, I'd like to associate myself with Commissioner Zerfus's comments. Thank you. Any further comments? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Mr. Chairman, that concludes the regular agenda. Turning now to the carry-in agenda. On page one of the carry-in, it is recommended by the Office of Special Assistance that the Commission adopt the proposed opinion and order regarding the petition for reconsideration filed in the formal complaint of Andre Lombard versus the Pico Energy Company. Is there a motion to consider the staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion made by Commissioner Yonora, seconded by Vice Chair Barrow. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Turning to page two of the carry-in, it is recommended by the Bureau of Technical Utility Services that the Commission adopt the proposed order in the application filed by PennDOT to remove and replace a bridge located in Butler County, Pennsylvania. Is there a motion to consider the staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion made by Vice Chair Barrow, seconded by Commissioner Coleman. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Turning to page three of the carry-in, it is recommended by the Bureau of Technical Utility Services that the Commission adopt the proposed opinion and order regarding the petition filed by Aqua Pennsylvania and the company's long-term infrastructure improvement plan and lead service line replacement program. Is there a motion to consider the staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion made by Vice Chair Barrow, seconded by Commissioner Yonora. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Continuing on page three of the carry-in, it is recommended by the Bureau of Technical Utility Services that the Commission adopt in an omnibus motion the suspension of the rate increase proposal filed by Aqua Pennsylvania Water and continuing the omnibus on page four of the carry-in to include the single item appearing on page four, suspending the rate increase proposal filed by Aqua Pennsylvania Wastewater. Is there a motion to consider the staff recommendations? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion made by Commissioner Zerf is seconded by Vice Chair Barrow. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a vote of five to zero. Madam Secretary. Turning to page five of the carry-in, it is recommended by the Law Bureau that the Commission adopt the proposed order regarding Act 12 of 2016, Section 1329 of the Pennsylvania Public Utility Code and the valuation of acquired water and wastewater systems. Is there a motion to consider the staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion made by Vice Chair Barrow, seconded by Commissioner Yonora. Any discussion? I do have a motion in this matter. I would ask uh, Vice Chair Barrow to take the chairmanship. Chair. Thank you. I recognize you, Chairman DeFrank, for the purpose of your motion. Thank you, Vice Chair Barrow. I ask that my motion be entered into the record as though I read it in its entirety. On February 7th, 2024, the Commission issued a tentative supplemental implementation order that included four revisions to our existing procedures regarding Section 1329 of the Code. We received comments from numerous parties, including members of the legislature, municipalities, municipal authorities, public utilities, advocates, and individuals. Today, the Commission considers the issuance of a final supplemental implementation order based upon its review of the comments. I am pleased to support this necessary step forward, which I believe, among other things, will better inform the public about 1329 proceedings, improve the public's understandings of potential rate impacts, and establish additional guidelines for the Commission to utilize in determining the prudency of acquisition prices and their prospective effects on customer rates. Nonetheless, I believe it is prudent to address two issues with this motion, public hearings and the data set for the reasonableness review ratio. Regarding public hearings, in the tentative order, we propose requiring selling utilities and acquiring utilities to conduct at least two in-person public hearings prior to executing an asset purchase agreement. 
We stated that the public hearing should address the proposed acquisition, describe the potential rate impacts, provide opportunity for public comment, and be held at venues within the municipal boundaries of the selling utility, if possible. We also stated that the acquiring utility or selling utility should be required to notify the selling utility's customers of the public hearing. We proposed to revise the application filing checklist to include public hearings and an attestation that the public hearings were held. Numerous parties filed comments indicating varying levels of support to the proposal. I believe the breadth of the comments provided substantially the adoption of the Commission's proposal to require public hearings. As we stated in the tentative order, the Commission believes this modification will assist in better informing the public of the transaction between the acquiring utility and the selling utility. Further, we stated hosting such hearings will give the public the opportunity to question both transacting parties and better prepare the public to participate in any eventual application at the Commission. Finally, we stated that bolstering such public input opportunity before the filing of the proceeding is further supported given the six-month statutory time frame the Commission currently has to adjudicate, it, to adjudicate perfected Section 1329 applications. I contend from my review of the comments that all these assertions hold true. Therefore, I believe the public hearing proposal and associated and necessary revisions to the application filing checklist warrant adoption in the final order. As to the reasonableness review ratio data set, in our tentative order, we proposed the calculation of a re reasonableness review ratio, or RRR, based on a seven-year data set. The seven-year data set would be updated annually to include the most recent four quarters and to remove the most dated four quarters. Consequently, this would result in a seven-year rolling average data set for RRR. The seven-year data set was proposed as it covered the time period between the passage of Act 12 of 2016 and the adoption of the tentative order. Upon review of the comments, I believe use of a larger data set is rational and prudent. However, I believe the data set should not include information that precedes the passage of Act 12. Therefore, I submit the, that the RR should commence with the initial, initially proposed seven-year data set while adding an additional annual period with every subsequent RRR publication. We will continue adding an, an annual period until the total set reaches 10 years. Once the 10-year data set is reached, the Commission should then utilize a rolling average of 10 years. Such revision will work to capture more data for the calculation of the RRR, reducing the potential for volatility in the RRR calculation and instilling an increased level of gradualism. In conclusion, I believe adoption of the final supplemental implementation order as revised by this motion, which includes modifications for rate impact notices, public hearings, default weights for appraisals, and a reasonableness review ratio is in the public interest. As the commission stated, section 1329 applications have elicited significant interest from the public and policymakers alike. These modifications to the Commission's administration of Act 12 are reasonable and necessary improvements based, on, based off our experience of over the, the eight years implementing the Act and the 27 1329 applications filed to date. Therefore, I move that one, the Law Bureau, with the assistance of the Bureau of Technical Utility Services, draft the final supplemental implementation order consistent with this motion. Two, the Law Bureau, with the assistance of the Bureau of Technical Utility Services, draft all necessary appendices to the final supplemental implementation order consistent with this motion. Three, a copy of the final supplemental implementation order and all appendices be published in the Pennsylvania Bulletin and posted on the Commission's website. Four, a copy of the final supplemental implementation order and all appendices be served on all parties of record at the above captioned docket. And five, this docket shall be marked close. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thanks, Chair. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Yonora. Any discussion on the motion? Uh, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any objections? I also am aye. Um, on, a, on final adoption, is there any objection to taking the previous roll call? I'd like to make some comments on the final 
Chairman. Dobson, thank you. Um, this is an issue that we've all um, faced over the eight years since the passage of Act 1329. We see a number of uh, legis bills, legislative pieces introduced in the General Assembly to address this. Um, I've stated before publicly um, that while I believe 1329 uh, acquisitions do play a role and should be in the toolbox, um, they are currently unfettered. They are currently, there's no restrictions on them. We need to put guardrails on uh, 1329 acquisitions. Um, so I just wanna go over real quickly what these four things will do. The first point is the rate notice. Uh, it requires, this order will require the uh, acquiring utility to notify uh, residents, customers of the uh, utility being acquired of what the potential rate impacts are. One of the things we've heard in both testimony before the General Assembly as well as cases here is the public was unaware of what was coming their way. We want to make sure the public has um, as much information as possible uh, moving forward to know what their rates may be um, as a result of the acquisition. As I stated in my motion, hearings. This requires two additional hearings uh, in the service territory being acquired. I think that's important. Again, one of the things we've heard from the public is the train was already out of the station, down the tracks before they knew of the acquisition. Um, we wanna make sure there's as much information on the front as is possible um, so the public is aware of these uh, acquisitions and transactions. Weights of appraisals. Um, one of the things that, uh, according to the law, Section 1329, there's three uh, pricing appraisal mechanisms uh, that's utilized. Um, what we've seen in applications that this commission has considered um, is those uh, appraisals aren't evenly weighted. Um, and we've seen at times when one of the appraisal methods reduced a low number, that that number was either thrown out or given a smaller percentage of the overall uh, price. Um, that shows me that there is intent um, by some appraisals to increase the cost and purchase price of these uh, acquisitions. We wanna make sure that all those cost methods are equally weighed uh, a third, a third, a third, a third. And then finally, the RRR. Um, this is something that we've struggled with, how we look at these transactions and compare them to the industry as a whole. One of the things that uh, we thought of in developing the RR is to look at the enterprise value of the entire industry, uh, of all publicly traded water utilities, look at the enterprise value compared to the depreciative value. What that ratio is, we should be consistent when we look at these acquisitions. Um, the last or well, at least the last acquisition that this commission considered, um, that that ratio was well beyond um, what what um, the RR would be considered under the current data set, and I think it's about 1.63, 1.63 currently. Um, we want to make sure what this does is it make it ensures the economic vitality of the industry. Well, you know, as I say all the time when we talk about um, acquisitions, and I always liken it to house purchases. You know, if you pay a million dollars to purchase a house that's worth $500,000, you can only do that so often, and eventually it catches up to you. While I realize we are talking about the ratepayers' pockets here, and while they are deep, they are not bottomless. They are not endless. And what we are going to do, unless we put guidelines and guardrails around this, um, we are going to effectively price people out of water affordability. Um, I think the advocates may argue that so some folks are there today. Um, but if we continue down this path, um, we are going to do that. So again, I think Section 1329 acquisitions do play a role, but there has to be some guardrails and guidelines on this, and that's what this uh, motion, this order, attempts to do. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Any other comments? Vice Chairman, if I may, just take a moment. I. Uh, Yes. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I want to commend the chairman for his leadership on this matter. Uh, for those of you that have been with us for uh, many months, you know this has been a hot topic of discussion for us. Uh, I think it's fair to say that there is stress with all parties involved in these transactions. Um, the commission through uh, this action this morning uh, and previous actions as the chairman has discussed, 
is, in my opinion, um, our surgical way of working around the statute to try to remedy some of those stress points. Uh, I think uh, our effort today is well-intentioned. Uh, I hope the message to the legislature is that this is not the end all. I still believe that there are some structural issues within uh, the statute that need to be corrected and that I would hope that the legislature would uh, find a way to um, get to a point where they can make those uh, structural changes for all parties. Um, as the chairman's indicated that this is, uh, this is getting to be expensive uh, for all parties and that uh, again the action today is our effort to try to mitigate some of those concerns but again I would just stress that in my opinion this is not the end all. I still believe that there is a legislative fix that's necessary to get us to a better place. Thank you. Any further comments? All right. The recommendation is adopted as amended by the motion of the chair by a vote of five to zero. Gavel's yours. Thank you, Vice Chair Barrow. Madam Secretary. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, that concludes all items to be considered today. <clears throat> Before we adjourn today, I would like to recognize Vice Chair Barrow for comments recognizing Juneteenth. Vice Chair Barrow. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd like to take a moment to recognize an important date in history, June 19th, 1865, and I'd like to start off with uh, a famous saying, um, until we all are free, we are none of us free. Um, that can be attributed to uh, Jewish American poet Emma Lazarus, <coughs> MLK Jr., and also Maya Angelou. Um, so June 19th, 1865 is when Union soldiers reached Galveston, Texas, the furthest point in the South with news of the end of the Civil War. Um, enslaved people were previously unaware that they had been freed more than two years earlier when President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation or that Confederate General Robert E. Lee had surrendered in Virginia two months earlier. It was in 2021 um, when Juneteenth became a federal holiday. And it is with great pride that I convey that the PUC will once again join in the observance of Juneteenth. Um, a few more words that come to mind when reflecting on this holiday include freedom, progress, equality, and most especially perseverance. Um, I encourage you to use this day to reflect and attend a local Juneteenth celebration and learn more about this special holiday. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Barrow. Next, I'd like to recognize Commissioner Zerfus for a statement on Pride Month. Commissioner Zerfus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The PUC joins the Shapiro administration and others across the Commonwealth in celebrating the month of June as LGBTQIA plus Pride Month. We continue to support the rights of all citizens to experience equality and freedom from discrimination. As was stated in the Commonwealth's proclamation for Pride Month this year, William Penn founded Pennsylvania on the principles of fairness, tolerance, and inclusion for all people in the rich cultural fabric of our Commonwealth has been woven by the people from all different backgrounds and walks of life. And we thrive when we celebrate the diversity that makes our community stronger. The proclamation further states that we must unite and denounce violence towards LGBTQ plus individuals, promote self-affirmation, dignity, and equality, mobilize communities, ensure all Pennsylvanians are protected under the law equally, and expand real freedom in our Commonwealth. This year's efforts during Pride Month focus on education and protection because people need protection in their daily lives, whether it's at work, school, and healthcare, or at Pride events themselves. It is worth noting that the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission just last year adopted a rulemaking that clarified the, de the definition of protected class within the Human Relations Act and the Fair Educational Opportunities Act to include the LGBTQ community, among other clarifications. And our very own Kelly Monahan, director of the Bureau of Audits, penned a reflection of what Pride Month means to her. 
And Kelly, it will be hard to give your words justice, but I thank you for trusting me enough to try. Kelly said that Pride Month is just as much about defiance as it is about joy. It's about the refusal to disappear and be quiet and stop making people uncomfortable. She said, I am proud to be part of an organization that cares for everyone we work with. As long as I have worked here, sexual and gender identity have been protected in the commission. But just as important, LGBTQIA individuals have been supported and celebrated. I have met so many wonderful people in my time here and have experienced a level of acceptance that I never imagined possible. It puts a lot more joy in my pride. So thank you for those words, Kelly, and as well said. Pride Month continues to serve as a powerful reminder to us all that our remarkable diversity is a gift that makes us all stronger. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Zerfus. And finally, I would like to recognize Commissioner Yonora for remarks about the 80th anniversary of D-Day, which we celebrated last week. Commissioner Yonora. Thank you, Chairman. Today we remember the sacrifice of the greatest generation who took the beaches and the skies over Normandy on D-Day. The 80th anniversary was remembered one week ago on June 6th. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, many of our American sons and daughters joined the armed forces. These included Don Chiavetta, father of our secretary, Rosemary Chiavetta, and Pat Solano, my close friend and mentor for 40 years. Although we have to think of these veterans as elders, we should remember on D-Day, it was a teenage Don Chiavetta that parachuted into France with the 82nd Airborne Division. And it was a teenage flight engineer, Pat Solano, aboard the B-17 Flying Fortress, providing air support to the ground troops. Being a good son, Don wrote his mother to tell her that he survived the initial assault. He eventually returned home after a distinguished service with the General Patton's Third Army. Pat also returned home after 23 combat missions in Europe. He went on to serve nine governors, was recognized as a trusted advisor, a voice of reason, and a unifying force at the Pennsylvania Capitol. Not all were so fortunate. Many never returned home having sacrificed their lives de defending our freedom on the beaches of France. Today we remember D-Day and all the men and women who ensured the freedoms of our nations and its allies at that fateful day. We, can, we, can, should, we should look to see the outside individuals as a model of courage and sacrifice as we face the challenges of our times. Today we give our thanks and remembrance and I would always like to thank our fellow veterans, my fellow veterans, for their sacrifice. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Yonora. If there's no other business to come before us, is there any objection to adjourning today's meeting? Hearing none, we are adjourned.